So we'll get going. Hi, everyone. My name is El Pair. I'm the Education Content Manager. If you haven't seen me before, I'm happy to welcome Henny Benamore. He's an uh, assistant professor at Arizona State University. And today he'll be talking to you guys about robot learning and neural networks. So Henny, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself again a little more, and then we can get going. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. As Alpa already said, I'm an assistant professor at ASU. And I work at the intersection of machine learning and robotics, really how to make robots self-adapt, self-program, and, and just generally being responsive and adaptive to their environment. And so here we see this cute little robot that we're going to be using today, actually, for some of our examples. So let's jump right into this. So yesterday I got a question on which books uh, are actually pretty good for getting into this field. And I said, hey, let me just create a slide for this tomorrow. And so that's exactly what I did here. So we have here a selection of different books. The two first books are books that I would recommend for people who maybe are already kind of getting into this field, are maybe also experts. So especially the leftmost one, deep learning, it's mostly for people who want to become like hardcore experts. It includes some math, um, so not necessarily always easy to get into, but it's still a very good book. The second one is more for practitioners. Um, and actually it's, it's, it's a great book. So for being for pr practitioners doesn't mean that it's a bad book. It's on the opposite, it's, it's actually a great book. Uh, less equations than the first one. And now the book that I think is the best for you, in my opinion, uh, at least, is the third one, which probably you have never heard of, which is called AI Techniques for Game Programming. And so really it's about how to create intelligent agents in video games um, that are adapted to the environment, they can learn to adapt to a user. And actually that is way closer to robot learning than the other two books, because it actually talks about active agents that have to seek out information about the environment and have to do human machine interaction. They have to adapt to the video game, uh, uh, to the user, effectively, to the gamer. Um, and you can buy the book for only about eight bucks used um, on Amazon. So, so I strongly recommend you uh, to buy that book. It's an amazing book. I loved it. Um, and um, you can learn so many things from it. So, so really, if you want to get into this, take the third book because it comes with great examples that um, really are way closer to robotics than the other two uh, books. Okay, um, so, and, and the author, by the way, is called Matt, Buckl Matt Buckland. Okay, so you remember the slide from yesterday, what we're trying to do in robot learning is to connect robots to the environment by having um, them effectively replace the traditional programmer by a machine learning component. So rather than having a programmer, we're now having uh, an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm that learns to adapt to the environment automatically and autonomously. So we don't need to have an expert there thinking about this, writing down equations and algorithms anymore. We just have some learning mechanism in the robot that allows it to adapt. And another way of thinking about this is really in the traditional programming paradigm, you as the expert, your task is to create a box. And that box, let's call it a program. So you have a program and the, this box, the kind of what, what you're trying to do with the box is to turn some input into output. In the case of robotics, the input could be what the robot sees, what the sensors um, tell us right now, so the sensor measurements. And we need to turn that into an output using our program. And typically the output would be the actuators for the robot. So basically control signals that tell the arm, okay, now move to the left and move up and so on, or um, actuation signals that tell the wheels to spin or not spin. So you as a designer and programmer have to think carefully about this. How can I turn the inputs into outputs? And now what we're trying to do as machine learning experts is to replace that paradigm with a different paradigm where we have inputs and outputs. And instead of us writing the code in the Python code or whatever in between that turns input to outputs, we just collect examples for inputs and outputs and have some machine learning, so-called supervised learning mechanism, turn that into um, of automatically find out the box in between. So we just give it examples. Whenever this is the input, this should be the output. Whenever this is the input, this should be the output and so on. And from these examples, 
supervised learning techniques can then generate the box in between, generate the program, which can turn any input into a corresponding output. So by giving it only a small example or a small set of examples, we can hopefully generalize to many, many new examples. Yeah? Okay, so let's imagine, for example, you're trying to program a robot to get through a maze. Yeah? We take a couple of mazes and we record how a human would navigate or control the robot to get through the maze. We record the data and then have a supervised learning algorithm turn inputs into outputs using kind of machine learning. So it, it learns the block in the middle, uh, the program. And then once we have that, we can use the program on new mazes and it generalizes to, uh, to new mazes and new environments. At least that's the hope. Okay, so that's what we're going to be learning about today, supervised learning for learning robot controls. And um, just to kind of let you uh, rehash a little bit or kind of remember a little bit what we were talking about yesterday, um, these kind of techniques, you can use them to learn everything from human robot interaction. Um, and by the way, all of these pictures are from my lab. So these are not just some kind of pictures you find on the internet. This, this is actual stuff we've done in my lab. So we've, we've used these techniques to have a robot interact with a human and learn to assemble Lego pieces. We use the techniques for having like a, a small cardboard robot, learn how to kind of uh, crawl over ground. Uh, and we use that for all sorts of like prosthetics, for example, for people who have an amputation or robots in industry that can perform manipulations in industry. So in our today's journey, what we're going to be doing is to take the simulated robot here and try to imbue it with some intelligence. The exact task, I'll be talking about that in a couple of seconds. But let's take a look at this robot and just at the rough level, understand what are typical things that you would need to have in such a robot. So if someone gives you such a robot, you go out and buy a robot like this. What do you want to have? Well, on the side of the brain of the robot, we need algorithms or programs that allow the robot to navigate, you know, gonna move around and avoid obstacles, for example. Well, we don't want the robot to be bumping into things. Similarly, we want to be able to control the arms of the robot in order to perform manipulation. So movement of the arms and manipulating objects is something uh, that's typically among the first things you want to do. But in order to get there, typically there is another level that you have to implement first and in the case of this robot, for example, it would be stabilizing the robot on the uni wheel, uh, making it somehow stable. And so this shows you that even for a relatively simple robot, this robot doesn't have too many um, degrees of freedom. It doesn't have many fingers, for example, just have kind of these clasps. Um, there's still a lot that you have to think about. And, and again, machine learning can help us uh, go away from the traditional programming paradigm to just kind of a data-driven paradigm. We can solve these issues by just collecting data and have the robot explore the environment and collect data and train from it. Now, how do we specifically do that? And today, as I mentioned already yesterday, I want to talk about neural networks, artificial neural networks. But Artificial neural networks are ultimately inspired by biological neural networks. So it really helps to have a rough understanding of how our brains work. Yeah? And so our brains are our biological neural networks. But at the same time, our brains have basically 100 billion neurons. Yeah? So our brains are these kind of compound um, kind of structures that are built on many, many neurons. So it has many, many neurons in there. And each one of those neurons is connected to many other neurons. So roughly each neuron is connected to around a thousand neurons. And these neurons, you can see them here on the right side. Uh, what you see there is a neuron. On the left side, the neuron has dendrites. And with these dendrites, it may be connected to about a thousand kind of other neurons. And what happens is the neuron gets electrochemical inputs, right? it, which actually just cause some sort of electric spike. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing. The neuron basically has some sort of rule for when it spikes or not. So it gets all of these inputs, all of these electrical signals from its neighbors. 
And then it only fires itself. So the neighbors fired and kind of all of that goes into the left side of the neuron. And then the neuron sums all of that up and only um, if a certain threshold is exceeded, uh, a, a certain voltage threshold, does the neuron also fire to its next neighbors. So basically it's an electric signal would then go through the neuron on the right side until the axon terminals, um, and those would then activate the next set of neurons. And so this is called an all or nothing response. So each one of these individual neurons can get some input, and if some threshold is exceeded, it activates. It's like a binary output, you know, for kind of if, if you're below the threshold, it doesn't activate. If it's above the threshold, it just activates with a uh, kind of constant current term, and that's it. And, and so you can think of it as like some sort of binary unit. Yeah? Okay, and the cool thing about our brain is that it's actually just kind of a, like a, a compound structure that has many of these neurons. Each simple neuron or each neuron is a very simple element, but put them together and have them kind of adapt to each other. And now you have something really, really powerful. Okay, if that's the idea, well, let's try to recreate that in a computer. And that brought people to the concept of a perceptron, which is some sort of like artificial neuron. Yeah, so it's, it's like a, an old word for artificial neuron. And again, this is basically just some sort of inspiration of how to copy the real world and then create it in the computer. Okay, so here we see a picture for this linear perceptron. Again, you can think of it as a neuron, as a biological neuron. On the left side, we have the dendrites. We have all of the inputs to the neuron. And on the right side, we have the output of the neuron, kind of fire or not fire. Yeah? So zero or one. And as we mentioned earlier, the, the neuron can have uh, like different uh, activations from its neighbors. And so here in our case, we say that that is the input to the neuron. And on the left side, we have input one, which comes maybe from a different neuron input two, and then something called the bias. For now, just think of it as another neuron or another input that goes in. So you have these inputs, and all of these inputs are summed up. So that's the sigma sign that you see there. That's basically just a mathematical sign for sum, for summation. So we sum up all of these inputs. And then if that exceeds a threshold, then we generate an output. If that doesn't exceed a threshold, then we don't generate an output, OK? But here's a small twist now to this. We're going to add weights. So not all of these inputs are going to be created equal. Sorry. And so some of the inputs have higher weight um, you can say that the neurons are kind of tighter, are kind of are, are tightly interconnected, whereas with other neurons, they're not so tightly inter, uh, interconnected. And we can model that as a weight. And so, um, so now we have, for example, input one, it has weight number one, W1. Input two has weight number two, and so on. And the output in this case would be what we call a linear addition, um, uh, a, a linear combination. So what it really means is we just multiply W1 with X1, which is the first input, and then add that to W2 times X2. So input one times uh, W1, input two times W2, input three times W3, and that's our output, okay? So that's this mathematical operation. We just sum up all of the Ws times K. Okay, so all of you or some of you may have had linear algebra, and in linear algebra, this is a very famous equation. Um, there is a question already. What is the bias again? I will explain that in a couple of seconds if you give me, if we give me that time. It's because it's actually a really cool idea. Um, for now, just think of it as an input. Yeah? The bias is just some input. Where is that? Okay, so um, this equation that I've wrote, written there, O equals the sum of wk times xk for k equals one to three. Does that remind you of something in linear algebra? How could we write that differently? It actually has a name, this operation of like something times something, something times something, w1 times x1, w2 times x2. Do you know that from linear algebra? Anyone? Come on, boys and girls. Anyone? Just throw stuff at me whatever you remember from linear algebra. Uh, 
Anyone? Just write that into the chat, uh, into the questions. The inner product, ah, good, yes, it's called, yeah, like it, I think the most common um, uh, way that you've seen it is, is the so-called dot product. Maybe just write yes or no. Who has heard of like dot product in, in math, uh, in your mathematics classes so far? Just kind of yes, no, just help me a little bit out. Yes, yes, no, so no is also okay if you write no. So some people are saying yes, no, 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 yes, yes. Yeah, so what we see there, excellent, yes, I've heard of it. With matrices yeah exactly that's basically like you can write it as two vectors um, and a vector is also nothing but the matrix so that was a good point that you suggested right there um so uh i don't have the name uh but like there is an anonymous attendee that said kind of this comes has something to do with matrices indeed um we can write the w's w1 w2 w3 as a vector um w and the x's Kind of x1, x2, x3 as a vector, kind of like we have a vector. And let me just kind of quickly do that. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I don't want to kind of scare you with all of this, but I just want to show you that these are really very simple concepts. Um, so if we can write it as a vector with x1, x2, and x3, and all of this is kind of stored in one vector that is bold x, bold x. Okay. Um, and the same thing, of course, for, for w, w, the vector would be w1 until uh, W3. Okay, so effectively a neuron not, implements nothing but what we know from a linear algebra as the dot product. Yeah, it's a dot product between the inputs and the weights. And the big magic in neural networks is, and, and what's called learning, is determining the weights because you have no control over the inputs. The inputs just come from the sensors, you know? From the camera of the robot, from the you know IMU on the robot, the gyro sensor, the pressure sensor, they just generate the inputs that go on the go in on the left right side, uh, left side, and then what you have control over, what you can learn and change for the robot to get smarter is the Ws, and then if you get the right Ws, then the output that's going to be generated is going to be an output that's helpful for the robot. It will allow the robot to do the right thing. And so learning in this context really just means determining the weights. That's it. That's really all you need to know about neural networks. And, and once you understand this neuron, a single neuron, then a neural network is just many neurons stuck together. That's it. And the big thing in neural networks is how to determine the Ws, how to determine the weights. We don't know them in the beginning. Um, okay, so before we get into that, let me just quickly explain to you what the bias is. Um, actually, let me just, I don't know, okay. So let me explain to you quickly what the bias is. And it's actually a very cool concept. Um, so if you, let me kind of, yeah, let's take this. If you take a look at this uh, equation here, it actually has no definition of a threshold. If you remember, um, kind of we said if the threshold in a neural network it activates if this output here is larger than some threshold, you know, larger than some threshold. The problem is we don't know what that threshold should be. Like, is it 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 I don't know, one or 0 0.001? I don't know, you know, and of course we don't want to set it. So a smart way to set it would be to let it actually automatically learn or have the neural network automatically learn what this threshold is. And it turns out that is exactly how we get this bias here. And for that, we need to understand something. Um, so let's say um, you have um, kind of a simpler version of this where you have W1 times um, X1, which is kind of your input plus w2 times x2 and that needs to be larger than a threshold you know um a thr threshold well we don't know what the threshold is but what we can do is to say well that's let's do a minus threshold and kind of pull the threshold to the left side so we have w1 times x1 plus any by the way we can't see any of the writing that you do on oh. to the left of the x2 Oh, to the left of the X2. Okay. To so the like, left okay. of the X1, sorry. So I think there's something covering it there. 
there is but... something covering it there. Okay, dokie. Um, in the, thank you so much for for pointing that out. Let me let me drive right over here. Um, so we yeah, have... we can't see it there. I you think can't the see it? no, I think the picture is covering the writing or something like oh, that. Oh, oh, oh. Can you yeah. see it here? Yes, it works. Okay, there. I'll write it here. Sorry about that. Um, so so let's do w one times x one uh, plus w two uh, times x two. Um, and originally we said kind of that needs to be larger than a threshold. But then what we can do is to do minus threshold. So the threshold disappears here. And you, and becomes, sorry, yeah? we can't we can't see it again there. Oh my God. Sorry um, about that. Can you see something any here? Yes, yes, Over I there? can see it there. So I think it the problem is below the linear perceptron and like uh, to the okay. right of that area. My sincere apologies, everyone. Sorry about that. No, 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 no. no worries. So, so kind of, okay, let's write it again. W1 times X1 plus W2 times X2. Um, and, okay. And then that needs to be larger than some threshold. Okay. Um, but what we can do now is to say minus threshold. And so it needs to be larger than zero. But now we have threshold on the left side. Um, kind of here, minus, oops. Um, so minus threshold. Okay. Do you see that so far? Yep. Upper? Yeah. So, you see that? so basically what we did is we have now, instead of a threshold, we have zero. And now we have this minus threshold. And so what I can do now is to say, well, that's the same thing as saying I've created um, some sort of input here that I don't know. So it's like saying minus one, uh, so just draw, oops. Um, it's like saying minus one times some sort of input here, which we will call bias. Huh? So now by doing that, I've actually removed the threshold and have now this input here, which automatically defines the um, threshold for me. So the bias here is effectively um, something that helps me um, define the threshold. And the way we do that is by saying minus one is what should be the input. And the B here is effectively our W3. And so after all of these equations and so on, what the only thing you need to remember is normally in neurons, they have this threshold. Only above the threshold do you activate. And the problem is we don't know where the threshold comes from. And an easy trick to avoid determining the threshold is to just create another input, which has minus one as an input to it. And the actual weight, the actual threshold is stored in the W. Okay. And, and by the way, kind of feel free to raise your hand or kind of ask a question if this um, goes over your head or if I'm not explaining it right. Okay, so now a very small twist to this. So typically when people do neural networks in the real world, they add some what's called a nonlinearity to it. So the output of the neuron goes through some function um, and the common function, and this is called an activation function, and a com common function that's often used is this function here, which is called the sigmoid function. And this is maybe not easy to understand, but let me just visualize it to you. The earlier output of the neural network would have been either zero or one. So kind of you have like this hard transition. And it turns out for mathematical reasons and for reasons of optimization, these kind of hard transitions are not good. Yeah? So they create like, also, if you think of it from a robot point of view, you could have like hard transitions in, in the robot behavior. We, we don't want that. What we like to have is like smooth transitions. And so that's when people said, well, can we create something like, like this transition from zero to one, but not as a hard edge, but rather as a smooth edge. And that's exactly what this nonlinear activation function does. It kind of smooths everything out. So the movement is smoother. And from a mathematical point of view, all of this becomes much more tractable. OK. Um, and that's basically it. So now that you understand what a single neuron is, a single neuron is nothing but you have some inputs, you multiply them with weights, and you check if the, the result of that, the sum of all of that, is above a threshold. Okay, and actually kind of 
just to make it a little bit smoother, we don't just take the sum, but we move the sum through some um, nonlinear activation function just to make it smoother. Yeah? That's called an activation function. And well, that's what defines a single neuron. And in order to train a neuron, we need to set the weights, the Ws. And that's a single neuron. If you have a neural network, that's called, by the way, a multi-layer perceptron. It's another way uh, of saying neural network. Um, a multi-layer perceptron is just multiple neurons stuck together. And so here we see, for example, um, one neural network that I'm using kind of in, in some of my examples. Um, and, and basically, you have some input units, what we call input units, that's what goes into the neural network. That's the input that comes from the sensors. And then you have some neurons which do these activations that we saw earlier, summing up stuff and multiplying it, uh, multiplying it with weights. But the difference here is that the output of a single neuron is going to go into the next layer of neurons. And so now we have this cascade, this layering of kind of computations. And one thing that's really cool about this, even if you have a very simple neural network that only has two layers, there is a proof that shows that you can learn all continuous functions. So that's actually a very broad class of things that you can learn. And with three layers, you can already learn all functions that are possible. And that's really, really cool. Okay, so now, now that we know the theory, let's actually use it for an actual robotics task. And we're going to take a neural network stick it into our robot, and we're going to learn the weights of the neural network so as to have the robot become smarter. In our specific case, we want to be able to predict whether the robot is going to collide in the next time step with something or not. Uh, this is very important because you want the robot to move around and not bump into things. And so- Annie, by yeah. the way, sorry, we have a question from Pranav. Ah, please go ahead, yeah. Um, he's, uh, Pranav said, if the smoothing function is not used, will the neuron only output zero or one? Exactly that. Yes, Pranav, you're absolutely right. It will output either zero or one if you don't use the smoothing function. That's it. And so that's what people originally did in the 60s, actually. And when they first created neurons and neural networks, they were thinking they want to stick to something that looks very similar to, you know, binary code. It just generates zeros and ones. But then eventually they learned, well, that's actually not really smart for a lot of applications where you have like these values in between. And so um, they added this kind of this, this nonlinear kind of smoothing function, the activation function. Um, and it actually comes with a lot of other advantages to do it that way. But when people started out, they just had it as a binary neuron and it would do exactly what you said, either spit out the zero or spit out the one. Does it answer your question, Pranav? Yes, no, maybe? Ah, uh, okay. So I don't see any response there. So let's move on. But Pranav, keep it going or keep it coming. If you have any questions, just um, shoot at me with a question. Okay, so, okay, yeah, our task. Our task was to teach the robot how to not bump into things. So really what we're trying to learn is some sort of predictive model. Um, so it should make a prediction. So a neural network that makes a prediction in the next time step, am I going to bump into the wall? Yes or no? Um, so in other words, the neural network will give us as an output, the output of the neural network is just collision or no collision, right? or maybe a value in between if it's uncertain, you know, if the network's like, oh, 0.3, it could be a collision, but I, I don't think so. Huh? Oh, so that present again. Okay, so that should be the output of the neural network. And now let's think about the, about the inputs of the neural network. Well, the inputs of the neural network could be the sensors of the robot. That would be the distance sensors. So sensors that tell us how far away objects are to the robot. And so it roughly looks like this. So we have the robot and it can measure using its sensors, uh, LiDAR sensors or whatever, measure distances to the environment. And those distances um, go as input to our neural network. And so in our case here, we have five um, laser sensors or LiDAR sensors that tell us the distance. And so we have five inputs. Any, so the, 
Yeah. We have two more. Sorry to cut you off oh, yeah. again. No, 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 no. No, please, please, please. Uh, someone asked, what's the nature of thresh of of a thre threshold? Sorry, a number mm -hmm. or a condition? It's just a number. It's really just a number. It's like 0.7, for example. And if the if after the summation at the neural network, the value is higher than 0.7, then it activates. Other, it, otherwise, it doesn't activate. So it's really just a number. It's not a condition. OK. Um, yep. Pranav asked one more. So it does not mimic the human neurons nowadays, but previously they had to act like human neurons all or none for the um, one or zero question. I think kind of, but up. actually, actually, it turns out human neurons work even more like human neur neurons are even more complex. They are like even the old model um, was not exactly like really, really mimicking neural network like human neural networks well. Um, but that part, yes, kind of it had this all or nothing response. Um, so the traditional perceptrons, let's call the perceptron, yeah? um, they have they have this all or nothing response, zero or one. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's exactly mimicking human neurons, uh, even the old model, because um, yeah, it turns out human neurons or like just biological neurons are yet a little bit more complex than what we're modeling here. Uh, so basically, Pranav, the answer to your question is yes, uh, but it turns out biology is always a little bit harder than what, what we think it is. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's get back to the uh, neural network that predicts whether we're going to have a collision or not. So we have five inputs and the output of the neural network should be a number between zero and one. And so if it's zero, then basically we're not going to collide. If it's one, we are sure we're going to collide. And if it's somewhere in between, then it's, you can think of it as something like a probability, like how likely is it to collide? So if you have like 0.8, um, then it's basically like, oh, oh, you're already in a very dangerous zone. If, if the likelihood or the output is 0.1, then very likely you're not going to collide. It may still happen, but very likely you're not going to collide. Okay, so now, now that we defined the structure of the neural network, so our neural network has five inputs and one output. And in this case, we're going to create it with two layers. It's going to have a hidden layer and the one single output unit on the output layer. Okay, so it has two layers and one input layer. And so how do we go about this? The interesting thing here is that differently to programming, you don't have to sit down now and think about the task. The only thing that you need to do in a smart way is to collect data. And what we need is data regarding the input as well as data regarding the output, okay? And in this case, one thing we can do is to just have the robot wander around randomly in the beginning. And then at each time step, we record the sensor values. So how far away objects are, as well as whether the robot is going to collide in the next step against the wall or not. So first you have the robot move around and whenever it collides, you take the previous sensor values from the last time step and you annotate them with collision. And whenever the robot was not colliding in the next time step, we just take the sensor values and say no collision. And so now we're just having the robot randomly move around, we can collect data. And, and you can really think of it as what you see here in the picture. The robot is just moving around and then whenever it bumps into something, we just label that those sensor values as, okay, that was a collision, okay? So now comes the learning part. So how, how do we go about this? We have the inputs, which is the sensor values and the outputs, which is collision or no collision. And now we want to have the box in between. They can turn the sensor values into these predictions. And, and that's, as I said earlier, that's called um, uh, supervised learning. And one famous algorithm for supervised learning is called backpropagation. Backpropagation is basically self uh, supervised learning for neural networks. And the only thing it does is to determine the weights. So remember we said earlier, that the intelligence is in the weights. So we're going to use supervised learning back propagation in order to learn the box in the, in the middle here between input and output. And for that, we're going to use the data set. And as I mentioned earlier, really learning in this context means we determine the weights. What are the weights? Uh, what are the values of the weights? And 
an important concept that you have to learn for that is the concept of a loss or a loss function. And, and the loss really means is how much do my outputs from the neural network deviate or how, how different are they from the true outputs that I'm expecting that are in my data set. You basically change the weights of the neural network until the outputs of the neural network come closer and closer and closer to what they should be and what they are in the data set that you collected. And once you're close enough, you stop. Yeah? So that's called backpropagation, changing the weights again and again until the outputs of the neuron uh, or the neural network match your expectation or what you collected in the data set. And there's one important concept here for you to kind of um, keep track of, and that's the concept of overfitting. You can also overdo this thing of training your network. Um, so imagine here we want to do, we have a task like this where you want to classify between um, blue dots and red dots. Well, if you train your network a little bit uh, with kind of not too many steps, then it may actually spit out um, some sort of classifier or some sort of uh, or a set of decisions that basically say, well, here along the blue line here, the diagonal, everything that's on top of that, uh, or like above that is blue and everything that's below, below that should be red. But that actually wouldn't really necessarily carefully reflect um, the data set because there's quite a number of blue dots here that are not captured. Let's now move to the right side, rightmost side. Um, here you could say, well, let's carve exactly out all of the blue dots and avoid the red ones. That's called overfitting. You've trained it too much. And, and it turns out overfitting is also a bad thing. You don't want to kind of fit every single data point because the data point may just be noise. Yeah? So at least in the real world, we have a lot of noise. And so if you're fitting your neural network to the noise, it may actually see patterns that are just noise. Yeah? And so when you get a new data point, that pattern is not really there anymore. And so what you want to do is something like this, uh, what you see in the middle. You want to train your neural network just to the right level so it generalizes well. It doesn't try to fit every noisy data point, but mostly it captures the structure of your data really right. Now, how do you do that? Well, there is one technique that's called early stopping. And so that's actually a really cool, cool idea. What you do is you divide your data set into a training set and to a test set. And you train on the training set and you always test on the test set throughout. And in the beginning, as you're training, you will see that the error, so what you see here on, on the y-axis is the error or the loss. And we want to minimize the loss. We want to have as minimal loss as possible. Right? And in the beginning, you will see that the loss for both the test set as well as the training set is going to go down. But eventually, they will start to diverge. You're going to start overfitting, kind of focusing too much on your training set. And what happens then is you're getting lower errors on the training set, but higher errors on the test set. So what you really want to be doing is to stop here, stop in the middle when you have like a nice fit. That's called early stopping. And really one way to do that is just to constantly spit out as you're learning with every iteration, spit out these values for how much training error you have and how much test error you have. And when the two start going away from each other and not both going down, you stop. That's called early stopping. Okay. okay. And as I mentioned yesterday, I want you to be able to actually get into this field and not just kind of think about it theoretically, but actually start yourself. And so there is one library, uh, a Python library called PyTorch, which is an open source machine learning library, um, freely available, and it comes with a wide range of networks and but also is, is really very accessible and very easy to use. And if you do that, you can actually implement everything that you saw earlier with just a bunch of lines of code. And so let's just quickly give you a glimpse of how to do that. Let's say you wanted to define a neural network. Let's see here if, if there's any question, by the way. Uh, okay. So let's say you wanted to define a neural network. Well, you can define that in PyTorch as class neural network. And then 
you create an init function and the init function, you define how many layers it has. So here, um, basically the self FC1, uh, it basically means fully connected one. And that's kind of the first layer. So that layer here, they just create a layer um, and it's basically it's just a linear layer, basically meaning it's an input layer. Yeah? So inputs and outputs are linear layers. They are not, they don't have this smoothing function anymore. You don't need to smooth the input. It's just, it's just the input. So it, they create this linear layer and it has as a size, exactly the input size, the size of inputs you get from your sensors. And then the output should be the size of the hidden layer. So now you've created the first layer. Okay, and then we create the sigmoid here, which is basically um, a sigmoid layer, um, or kind of our sigmoid activation function. So you saw it earlier, that's the smoothing function. That's this, this like not hard transition, but like rather smooth transition. So that's called the sigmoid. So you create the sigmoid. And then you create yet another layer. Um, and now this time, it takes as input the outputs from the previous layer. Oops, let's go back. The outputs from the previous layer, it generates as an output the number of classes you have. So in this case, it's a classification task. So let's say you have classes cats and dog, the num classes would be two. Okay, and then you also need to define what's called the forward function. The forward function tells us if we give it some input, how does it get processed by the network? So let's say X our in, is our input. So X first goes into the first fully connected layer. So X here goes into the first fully connected layer. So let's kind of just quickly annotate that. We have our X here. Yeah? And then we process it through the first fully connected layer. So we have our X. It goes into the first layer. So this is layer one. Ugh, my handwriting is bad. So layer one. And then the result of that, this out here, goes as an input into the sigmoid function. So now we have the sigmoid function that processes whatever came out of the first layer, sigmoid. And then the output of that sigmoid goes as the input into the next layer, fully connected to. Um, so basically the output of this goes into layer two. And um, yeah, well, and, and that then generates the overall output. So the second layer generates the overall output uh, out. Okay. Well, and that's the definition of the neural network in PyTorch. It's very easy. And even all of, even though all of this may be looking like, like a lot to you, uh, just take your time with it. It's, um, it's really easy. Okay. Now to the loss function. So we said earlier, we want to define a loss function tells us how apart or how different our outputs from the neuron uh, neural network are from the true outputs that are in our data set. And the loss function tells us, are they close or are they further away? And the most common loss function that people use is the so-called mean squared error loss. Well, it's just a squared error. And well, in PyTorch, you can easily create it by just saying, hey, um, NN MSE loss. And that's basically it. And now training the neural network, the back propagation algorithm is also relatively simple, uh, but it involves like six lines of code or so. And it's always the same, the same set of uh, lines of code. So there's only minimal things that you have to change if ever you have to change it, but actually you don't need to change uh, that in your task. So um, basically you create this optimizer, which will run your um, back propagation. Um, and you basically initialize the optimizer, you say zero grad, that's kind of an initialization function. Um, and then you use the loss function that you've defined earlier and the optimizer in order to automatically generate the weights that would make you, the outputs of the neural network match the outputs that are in your data set. That's it. So these one, two, three, four, five, six, lines of code will implement for you the back propagation output. And that's it. That's all you need for this task. Okay, so let's get back to our robot example. Now remember we collected the data set where the robot um, takes as input the distance 
of objects in the environment. So that goes into the neural network. And the neural network should tell us, are we going to collide in the next step or not? So keep in mind, this is a predictive network. So it tells us not right now, are we colliding? It's really the next step in the next step, are we going to collide or not? And so if in the next step, there is a high likelihood that we're going to collide, meaning the neural network gives us high values, one or 0.9 or something, then we should probably just turn around and go somewhere else. And that's, that's exactly how I implemented it. I created this small neural network, I trained it. And whenever the neural network tells me there is going to be a high likelihood of collision, I just have the robot turn away and go into a different direction. And that's exactly what we see here in this video. So we have our little robot and you can see the sensors there. Um, so actually it's still full screen. Um, you can see the sensors and when the sensors collide with an obstacle, they turn red. And um, then our neural network basically tells us, oh, we're probably going to collide. And when the neural network tells us that, then we have the robot just turn into a different direction and go in that direction. And so this robot here learned to navigate completely in a data-driven fashion. Like it was never really programmed to do that. We just collected data of it bumping into things. And then after that, it was able to, well, obviously avoid collisions. Now you may be thinking, okay, in simulation, that's fine. Can we get this in the real world? Well, um, that's exactly what we did. Uh, but before we get into that, um, actually let's get immediately to that. Let's, let's do immediately the real world. So here's a video of a small robot from my lab. Um, and if you ever visit my lab, I can show you this robot in, in reality. Uh, it basically tries to avoid obstacles using the techniques I just described right now. So it has a, a LiDAR sensor on top that can measure distances to the walls. And then all of that goes into a neural network. The neural network says whether we're going to have a collision or not. And if we have a, if there's a high likelihood for a collision, it will steer away into a different direction. Um, and you can see that the robot is doing a pretty good job at avoiding obstacles. Um, what I like the most is something that's going to happen at the end of the video, actually. So let's watch it to the end. So here you can see it's making these small corrections. Huh? And so here at the end of the video, a human is going to step in front of the robot. Ah, you see that? The robot even backed off, like it, it kind of foresaw that a collision is going to happen and then backed off. And then now we just stop the robot. Yeah? Okay, so everything that you've learned today, first of all, you can easily implement it in, um, in, in PyTorch. And secondly, you can immediately also put it to use on your robot. And for the next couple of minutes, I want to just show you that this is not limited to robots. You can actually use it for your autonomous cars. And in fact, this is partly how autonomous cars are implemented. So um, in autonomous cars, what you'd like to have is the ability to predict accidents and collisions before they occur, because then you can you know, either steer away or push the brakes and so on and so on. And ultimately it's the same thing. It's just that now the sensors are not necessarily kind of LiDAR sensors. They could also be a LiDAR sensors, but likely what you wanna have is to have to take the full camera image and do make your prediction based on that. You have the camera image and we want to predict into the future, are we going to collide or not? What we did in a paper, uh, in a relatively recent paper of mine, which got some attention also by the car manufacturers, is not only to use the camera readings, so the camera input, but also what's called proprioception. So basically the velocity of the car. So as you're driving it, what's the velocity of the car and where are the camera's positions on the car? Similarly, we can take as input to the neural network, the current um, steering actions, kind of in which direction is the person steering? Uh, because it really makes a difference um, whether you're colliding or not um, based on, which direction you're going. If you're just heading kind of full on into an obstacle, yeah, well, then you're going to collide. Whereas if you're drifting away from that, then um, maybe you're not going to collide. Similarly, we also measure the acceleration and take that as input to the neural network. And then we make a prediction, the same thing that you saw earlier. We have basically a neural network that takes all of that as input and makes a prediction at the end 
collision or no collision. Um, and you can see here that in this example with autonomous driving, you may actually be taking as input the information from multiple cameras because nowadays cars, they actually, they don't have a single camera. They have maybe like eight cameras or so. And, and we could technically use all of those. Um, and here's, here's just an example um, of a simulation um, showing this with the um, collision checking on the right side and no collision checking on the left side. And you can see um, using our approach on the right side, we can basically avoid a collision. Whereas on the left side, like the red and blue car actually hit each other. Um, let's actually take a look at that from the first person view. Then it's a little bit more dramatic. So on the left side, we're going to collide. On the right side, not. Uh, boom. Ah, on the left side, there was a collision. So with all of this stuff, you can immediately put it to practice. Um, and actually, it's also something that may help you if you apply for like uh, an engineering position or roboticist position at like Tesla or any one of these companies. So this stuff is really, really highly sought after. And if you can show skills in this domain and, and basically be able to run this example and then basically do this example in your internship, um, I'm fairly certain that um, you, can, you can gain an edge over others that are applying for the job. OK, Okay. so, well, I we have a time. quick question, honey. Sorry about yeah. that. No, no, no. Um, someone good. asked, how is the train model deployed onto the robot? Is the robot communicating continuously while moving to perform the inference? Or do you create some sort of executable version of PyTorch that can be stored and run on the robot's board? Wow, that's, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> um, honestly, it's um, there are some people who are probably more of an expert on this because deployment of models is not necessarily my field of uh, study. But typically how it's done is you, you create your code in such a way that it can take as input uh, a PyTorch model. So think of it really like, um, like any like file from like Microsoft Word or something. You just load the file which has the weights of the neural network. That's the PyTorch model. And kind of at the beginning of your program, the, the program that you compiled for your robot, you load in the, the weights and you then kind of on the robot, on the actual board of the robot. Um, so embedded in the robot, you do the inference. So that's typically how you do it. And um, so for example, NVIDIA is selling this, uh, what is it called? NVIDIA, ugh. Uh, so Jetson, the Jetson, Jetson, yeah. Jetson, they sell these Jetson boards that allow you to do inference on the board itself uh, or Jetson Nano or something like that. Um, uh, Intel also had like some something, but unfortunately, like it didn't really work out. And then they started creating sticks for it. Uh, I don't remember what the Movideo sticks, I think. There's some weird name, Movideos, Intel Movideos. And, but basically those sticks, um, the, the underlying idea is that they can do inference really well, but you have to provide them with the model file that stores the um, the weights of the neural network. Exactly, the, the neural compute stick, exactly. Intel is selling that. And they're basically trying to outcompete each other, these different companies for this market, because they're seeing that it's basically one of the fastest growing markets right now, doing um, embedded inference on, on, on your uh, kind of autonomous car or any smart device, you know, whether it's an autonomous car or a Fitbit or uh, kind of any one of those. Um, one thing to keep in mind there, however, is the what we don't have really well today is adaptation and continuous learning. So typically the way it's done is kind of you learn like at the manufacturer and then you deploy the model as a file. So uh, for example, when Tesla kind of sends these you know autonomous driving updates that you can think of that as like some files with weights uh, plus some additional code to kind of process the input data or something like that. Um, and they can deploy that. And, and actually nowadays they've charged like a fee for that where like for $200 or whatever, you can get better models from them over time. Um, yeah, I hope this answers the question, but it, it's generally, it's a pretty big field deployment of um, machine learning. It, it's, it's a really big field because you want inference to be very fast and there are many ways of doing that. And the question is, do you bake 
the structure of the neural network and the weights into your binary code, or do you load it? Um, a lot of what's done today is loading, but I can see advantages in baking of baking the weights into the actual um, into the actual software and, and during the compilation process. So the question is then: Will it be uh, will it be probably a problem for Tesla trained model in the U.S. deployed in Africa or Asia for the cars? Oh yeah! Oh, it's a big problem for sure. Um, and other companies have seen that. So if you train in the US or certain parts of the US, you may not see snow. Um, so as you know, a lot of companies are collecting training data in Arizona or you know, um, San Francisco, so California. And these are very you know, sunny parts of the US and they have like very flat uh, kind of structures and they have like a grid-like structure for the street, which is not necessarily true if you go to Africa. Similarly, if you if you take these models and deploy them in let's say Germany, like I come from Germany, we have a lot of snow, and like we have sometimes like five six months of the year with snow there. And so, a neural network that's never seen snow or or never seen a stop sign that has like partial snow on it will probably get confused. And what happens then is not clearly defined. And in fact, some of the work that I've done in my lab is to analyze what happens to a neural network when it gets inputs it has never seen before. And how can we secure that in such a case, the neural network is not just going to freak out and do something really, really dangerous. You know, if, if the neural network drives on, let's say a bridge and it has never seen these kind of bridges before, it just sees all sorts of stuff. Um, and then it decides to you know, turn left or turn right on the bridge. Uh, well, that could be fatal. And so, um, so yeah, this, this is a big problem. It's not solved. Yeah, so, so one of the attendees is saying, this is why probably having causal inference uh, be more important. Yes, to so, some degree, but the causal inference doesn't necessarily remove the issue of what happens when you have what's called an out of sample, um, out of distribution sample. What that means is to see something you've never seen before. Uh, with causal inference, uh, like at least kind of the method that I know, they, they wouldn't necessarily really tell you, okay, this is something I haven't seen before. Uh, um, and so part of what we need is also methods that tell us how certain or uncertain neural networks are about their predictions. Are they really sure? And um, another thing is, how can we add an additional layer of safety and security into the inference process? Um, and so for example, just to give you a short example of what I've done in my work is, um, we created a monitor for neural network, which basically is a, you can think of it as a module that constantly looks at the output of the neural network and tries to also over time make sense of it and also say, hey, it seems like the neural network is not really like doing the right thing right now. So for example, if, if the neural network is detecting in front of your car, someone on the bicycle in one frame and the next frame, it says no one on the bike, like there is no person in front of us. And the frame after that, it again says someone on the bicycle. So you have this discontinuities over time. The network is basically saying something, then something opposite, and then something opposite again. Um, you can have a, a module, a monitor, monitor this behavior and say, hey, like something weird is happening right now. Um, so you can think of it really as some sort of supervisor. And, and that's a very interesting research direction of how to create a supervisor for neural network. Another way to solve this issue is to change the loss functions and create new loss functions that guarantee that you are never above a certain threshold of errors. The, like the worst possible error the neural network could make is like bounded, we say, kind of limited in size. Okay, so let's move on. I think I'm, I'm mostly at the end of the lecture, but let me just show like one or two videos and then kind of we, we wrap up the lecture. Um, just a couple of examples of really cool stuff you can do with robots and robot learning. Um, and in this case, it's the task of ball in the cup. So this is actually a friend of mine. She's teaching the robot how to do ball in the cup. And um, you can, again, you can use your neural network and you train the robot to do that. Um, but maybe the robot is not really doing the right thing. And so in this case, you can still continue collecting some data um, in a very similar way to what we did earlier with the random movements. Uh, and then over time, the robot gets better and better at this. And then eventually, 
Um, yep, there we are. After 45 trials, I think this is the first time where the bond is going to go into the. Oh, no, actually, it didn't. It didn't hit it. Uh, after 60 trials, let's see, the ball went to the curve. Oh, no, it didn't. Oh, actually, that's interesting. Uh, after 100 trials, finally, finally did it. Okay, so that's one interesting example for this. Um, and this one is a, a very famous one where um, Google basically trained the robots to be able to pick up objects. And it's a very sim similar structure actually to what we did. You could even say it's the exact same thing. It's just in their case, the robot always predicts if the object is going to stay in the hand or not. Is it going to be stable in the hand or not? So it's constantly collecting data where it picks up an object. And if the object falls down, it says the neural network uh, basically says instable. And if the object stays in the hand, then the neural network um, outputs stable. And so now over time, by collecting data from many, many robots, they can train the neural network to predict when a grasp is going to be stable or not. Okay. And so over time, the network becomes really good at picking objects and lifting them without them falling out of their hand. And you can see that experiment here. They basically repeatedly grasp objects, try to lift them. And if they stay in the hand, they label that as good or like, uh, yeah, like stable. And if, if they don't stay in the hand, the object falls out, they label that as uh, instable. And they learn a neural network that uh, basically predicts this stability. And as a result of that, they can then use it to stably grasp objects. Um, and then the final one, kind of more as a final anecdote, um, effectively, a colleague of mine, Katsu Yamane, used these kind of techniques to create like small robots that crawl over ground and get better and better at um, crawling and, and doing really interesting um, things. And, and he was working for Disney at the time. So Disney is interested in using these techniques to create like artificial creatures that um, kind of move in a very interesting and dynamic way. Okay. And so with that, we come to the end of the class. We learned about supervised learning. We used that to predict collisions. We saw at the end that this relates to some of the things that Google did in order to learn grasping. And by the way, the, the Google paper actually just came out like three or four years ago. So we're talking here about relatively state-of-the-art things. Yeah? And so if you implement what I just showed you earlier, and I, I showed you even the code, um, basically like you would have done something that Google very recently still was writing papers on. Yeah? And yeah, I mean, that, that's it basically. And, and tomorrow we'll be talking about evolutionary algorithms, which is another really, really cool topic. And so I'm looking forward to that. And so with that, I, I finish my talk and I'm open for any more questions that you have. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Jenny, for spending your time with us today. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, we can take one final one. But um, since we're over time, we can't take too many. Oh, that's very kind of you. Someone is saying um, thanks for another great talk. Really appreciate it. And as I said, I'm looking forward to evolutionary algorithms tomorrow. And you'll yeah. see that we can actually um, automatically create the Homer Simpson under an X-ray. So just stick around for tomorrow and I'll show you how to create Homer Simpson autonomously and it will look like Homer Simpson under the X-ray. <laughs> that sounds like it'll be fun. Um, oh, it will. Okay, so we have one and yeah. So besides PyTorch, um, there is another one from um, Google, I think. It's called TensorFlow. And, and so these are kind of the competing big packages. PyTorch is um, funded by uh, Facebook AI, and TensorFlow is by Google. TensorFlow is the older one, the more mature one. PyTorch is easier to get to. So if you're starting, I would recommend PyTorch. If you are kind of already sure of yourself, um, and, and just want to kind of very, go very deep very quickly, then TensorFlow is, is the right thing for you to do. Generally, however, I would strongly recommend both, uh, like to, to all of you to get some experience with both of these. If you write that into your CV, it will substantially bolster. It. So having experience in either PyTorch or TensorFlow um, is really, really big plus on your CV. By the way, any resources that Dr. Benamore talks about will be in an additional resources link in the event description to all the attendees who are wondering about that. Um, yeah, I think okay. that's all. Thank you so much again, Dr. Benamore. Absolutely.
my pleasure and talk to you tomorrow then. Talk to yeah. you all tomorrow. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.